We walk above it every day. All around us, things are made out of it. Buildings, bridges, memorials. But have you ever stopped to think about that rock called granite and where it comes from? Only a few spots in the world have the kind of granite that's prized for memorials, for cemetery headstones. And one of them is in northeast Georgia, the town of Elberton, which some call the granite capital of the world. The people of Elberton make more granite memorials than anyone else in the world. On a hill a few miles outside of Elberton stand enormous blocks of blue-gray granite. They are called the Georgia Guidestones. No one knows who put them there or why. These monoliths are on the edge of a little Georgia town owes its livelihood to a rock. But it's a very special rock prized for its fine grain, its blue-gray color, its consistent texture. Geologists have identified a deposit of granite here that's about 35 miles long, averages about six miles wide, and they estimate it to be two to three miles in depth. So naturally, one of the reasons why the industry began here is because we're blessed with this great abundance of this natural resource. The farmers looked on these rocks that they encountered out in the fields as a, as a big nuisance, not realizing that uh, uh, one day that would really be fields of gold for them. Elberton granite was first quarried in 1889. It was used to build bridges. It was broken into gravel to support railroad tracks. A few years later, an Italian stonecutter named Peter Bertoni came to Elberton and built the first granite manufacturing plant in Georgia to produce memorials, tombstones. And by the turn of the century, the Elberton granite industry was flourishing. More people found out about uh, Elberton granite through uh, public relations efforts and marketing efforts. Freight rates, which had uh, been very restrictive for any products from the South, were uh, loosened and it was became more economical to ship it from here to other places. One of the crazier stories from Elberton's early days involves a granite Confederate statue, some angry young men and a hot August night. This granite statue was the very first monument manufactured in Elberton nearly 100 years ago. In fact, the first granite plant here was built especially so the local townspeople could have their own Confederate memorial erected on Elberton's public square in 1898. People thought the statue was ridiculous, saying it looked like a Union soldier, or worse, certainly not a Confederate hero. As legend has it, one spectator said the statue looked like a cross between a Pennsylvania Dutchman and a hippopotamus. Hence, he was named Dutchy, and it wasn't long before the townspeople could stand him no more. After two years standing on Elberton's town square, some local young men pulled Dutchy down one August night in 1900 and buried him. But exactly where Dutchy was buried remained a mystery until 1981, when the Elberton Granite Association somehow found the statue, dug him up, cleaned him at a car wash, and put him in a museum. Granite is now the largest industry in town. There are more than 250 granite companies employing 2,200 people with an annual payroll of $46 million. For every dollar of sales, uh, economists will tell you that that dollar turns over five times within the community. So it has like a multiplier effect. So for every dollar of sales, uh, you have five dollars worth of value that's put into the economy. One hundred and forty million dollars in granite industry sales reflects into a six hundred million dollar impetus to the Elberton economy. Salaries pay rent, buy homes and clothes and food. Granite company profits pay to expand factories and buy tools and supplies. Many of the specialized tools they use, diamond saws, chisels, even industrial diamonds are made in Elberton. Machine shop after machine shop sprung up around the area where we were able to begin producing steel for derricks, uh, steel for drill bits, 
and stone working tools and machinery for our own use uh, so that we weren't dependent upon foreign suppliers from Italy or Germany uh, to uh, provide our stone working equipment. We could make it here locally just as good as it could be bought anywhere in the world. A hunk of Elberton granite passes through many hands and machines before it gets to a customer. The process starts in the quarry. Today, a process invented in Elberton called jet piercing cuts the rock. This technique burns fuel oil mixed with oxygen at a temperature of 2,800 degrees. It doesn't melt the granite, but it literally blasts it apart. Once the outline of the block is cut, horizontal holes are drilled and dynamite frees the granite. In the granite factory, some of the largest diamond saws in the world cut a granite block weighing as much as 15 tons into manageable pieces. Another machine makes the pieces even smaller. Man and machine then polish the stone smooth before it finally goes to the stone cutter. Using a hammer and a chisel may look old-fashioned, but Frank Bradford is state-of-the-art. The way that I'm holding this tool and catching just a little at a time, what I'm trying to do now is work this top down to that line. Frank and his two brothers working behind him are among the most skilled and highest paid granite workers in town. To get the rock in the shape and stuff, we don't have a machine or anything that will uh, break it into shapes and all that uh, you can put it in because it's so brittle, you have to work it with a hammer and a chisel. The art of stone cutting is knowing just the right angle to hold the chisel and just how hard to hit it with your hammer. No machine can feel granite the way a human stone cutter can. And every piece of granite cuts differently and has its own character. We have something like uh, 800 and something different shaped rocks that we have now with different patterns and things that we have to cut. And some of it's sawn out, a lot of it's rock pitch. And this is what you call rock pitch, what I'm doing here. When I get through with this top, this will be a rock pitch top. Today, designing memorials is high-tech because 10 years ago, people like Chip Rousey started using computers to create the art for memorials. We have particular designs that everybody uses or company designs, and uh, they want their specific design that they have out in the cemetery or their uh, actual monument display. And so we would use those over and over, and so instead of redrawing, the beauty of the computer was it was there once you put it in one time. And when you cut it, uh, two years from now, you could cut the same exact design. The computer sends the design to a cutting machine that creates a stencil. That stencil is glued to the granite and sent to a sandblast artist. The artist sprays a special grit out of a nozzle at high pressure. With the right flourish, an artist can create the lettering for someone's name or a flower or a face. Everywhere you look in Elberton, you are reminded of the granite industry. The old bank on the square is made of granite. The local granite museum is built using granite. There's even the Granite Bowl, the high school football stadium. As the granite industry goes, so goes Elberton, I guess one could say. <laughs> Certainly, if the granite industry were not here, uh, Elberton would be a much smaller place, in my opinion and it would be a place that offered uh, many less opportunities for people to earn a living. About half of the granite quarried around Elberton is thrown away because it doesn't meet the granite industry's high standards. 